and welcome to the 495. I'm your host, Doug Sparks, editor-in-chief of Merrimack Valley Magazine. Lou, how are you doing this week? Doing okay. Technical wrestling most of the week. Do you, do you, have, to, uh, do you have to shovel your driveway? Do you do that? Well, um, I was on the island, on Plum Island, so yeah. we got we maybe got three inches of snow. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. it, it was all rain and that's, wind. That's right. It was different in all different parts, and I hear people who are... And when I got neighbors. downtown, it's basically three miles from where I live. When yeah. I got downtown, there was a foot, there was a foot plus, but, yeah. you know, out of, right against the ocean, you know, wind and rain, that was basically it. We were slammed. Yeah. We were slammed, and it took me longer to shovel my driveway than it's ever taken before. Yeah, was it heavy where it was it, all snow? It was kind of heavy, yeah. and then it was like really... So I act, and, and, and that was, it took me a long time, plus the night before I went out and, and shoveled twice, because I, I just felt like I was going to get slammed. Now, it's nice. It's nice to get out there and kind of move around and shovel I and, guess. and move. <laughs> no, it is. I put my, I listen to like Audible. I, I put, you know, like I can listen to audio yep. books, and I have young kids. I, I, you know, no, no secrets here. It's nice to get outside. I won't bit. lie to you. I drove right out of the driveway. Really? <laughs> yeah. All right. I won't lie to you. <laughs> well, if you ever want to come shovel my driveway and yeah, help no. me out, you'll get to experience. I'll let you borrow I've my shoveled my, enough my driveways. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Our guest this week's name is Richard Raven. His his uh, debut novel, Nothing to Declare, just came out officially yesterday. Richard, how are you doing? I'm doing great. You're in you're in Newbury right now, right? I am. Yeah, but you didn't. My, grow- I'm in my barn. Okay, <laughs> but <laughs> nice you barn. Uh, you did you didn't grow up in Newbury. You're you lived in in California for for some time, right? I did. I grew up in Newton, though. Oh, okay, I actually started in J to make a plane in Newton, and then uh, after I graduated college, I I moved to L.A. Okay, so in some sense, this parallels the the trajectory of the novel and the plot because you have characters as kind of uh, you know Boston uh, you know area. And there's stuff going out in California. True. Yeah. So every, for, every place that the novel goes, I have been. Okay. Oh, excellent. Okay. Well, we'll get into that. So uh, for someone who doesn't know anything about this, what's this novel about? What's, what's at the, the heart of, of Nothing to Declare? It, it's, it's about what happens to a man who thinks he has his life in perfect order and in, in a, a random event, the death of a friend, throws him off course. And as he moves through this experience, he attempts not only to understand where he really fits into his own life, but what happened way back when. They were very close friends, and then they had a huge falling out. And uh, I, I wanted to tell a good story about interesting characters. The bulk of the story is set in the 1970s in Santa Cruz, California, which was a hotbed of political, social, cultural, and sexual uh, revolution, so to speak. And and our characters find themselves in that midst. And then there's sort of contemporary sections of the story, which are set in the 90s, which are about a kind of final reckoning with both those years and, and you know, who we thought we were and who we ended up becoming. So, Yeah, there's something that struck me. Which of these, as I was reading it, which of these periods is more like our own, right? 1973, Nixon... Uh, things going on in the counterculture, things going on in food, in the food world, uh, versus 1990? Well, I, I think there's bits, I think there's actually bits of both in our world, because it seems to me that, that our cultural world, there's a lot of, uh, the, the world of, of, of today, there's a lot of uh, change in social dynamics. There are people in polyamorous relationships, there are people uh, there's same-sex marriages. There's a whole thing about gender that's you know fairly new to, to uh, maybe not to the world, but to our acknowledgement of it at least. And I think the beginnings of that or tastes of that were set in the 70s. On the other hand, it's a, you know in the 90s section there's a very commercial universe. The main character owns a restaurant. And it's a very hip, sleek, fashionable restaurant. He makes a lot of money at it. He drives a BMW. I mean, it's a lot about consumerism and about about sort of who he thought he was when he started out and who he ended up becoming. So I think there's tastes of both. And I think probably more than ever, uh, this story resonates now because of the social changes we're going through. Yeah, we were talking before the show about Instagram, and and I I think you said you have an Instagram account. You don't seem to to use it a lot. Uh, But there was was a lot of imagery in the book from like the 1973 part that was very like 
Instagrammable, like an Instagram hipster. Like if you went and had a conversation with a, a young 22-year-old foodie hanging out at mill number five in Lowell, uh-huh. uh, you would be talking about the, a lot of the same stuff that your characters were talking about back in 1973. Like the, the trendy dishes were similar. Like even like the aesthetic. Uh, there's, there's, there's a character who's making these, uh, these shirts with the monkey god, Hanuman. Yeah, right. on them which is like trendy now like if you if you saw a bunch of yoga models on instagram right now they might be wearing hanuman shirts and on top of that we have the nixon hearings and everything going on presidential with all this like ter- you know kind of national turmoil that people are either ignoring or being stressed out by and i just i found it very striking i found it striking that in some ways i felt like i understood 1973 in this novel more than i understood 1990 having lived through well, actually, I was one year old in, in 1973. I felt like I had more in common with the characters in 73. Well, I, well I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> yeah, it is a compliment, but, but, but here's one of the big differences. The kids in 1973 are running the world now. That's why it seems so similar. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. maybe that's, that's yeah. it. But there's also a sense of, of freedom. I mean, there's, there's a, a dark side to everything that's going on in 73, too. But there's also like, man, that must have been fun. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of freedom. And, and that begins to something changes. Absolutely, and I think I think what I was curious about. I mean, I I approach writing as an investigation. I didn't have a set idea exactly about what was going to be happening in my book. I had a sense that there would be these two time frames. I had a very rough sense of the geographical kind of flow of the novel, but it really kind of evolved as I as I wrote. But I did I did want to just sort of shake the tree about all of those things that you're talking about. And to understand better what it meant to grow up in those times, and to think, I mean, you know, I'm 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 of that era. I was I could have been the characters in that story, though I never lived in Santa Cruz. I just visited a lot, um, and you know, I was very curious to sort of you know investigate and almost prosecute the idea of what did, what did we think we were doing for the world, and how much of it really came true, and you know. Uh, uh, that was an impetus for the story. Yeah, it uh, well, and this is interesting. And I want to dig in on this because there's there's sort of change going on at the individual level and change going on at the social level, and I and I'm wondering how you separate those things. In other words, to to me, 1990 starts to get a little bit grim, a little bit constrained, a little bit like hunkered down. The sense of freedom, the sense of fun seems to disappear. But how much of that is the characters getting older? and getting maybe wiser or, or just simply getting tired? And how much of that is something historical? How much of that is big picture? I, I, again, I think it's a little bit of both, but I think it's more big picture than individual. Mm-hmm. And I think, it, you know, if you read my book, you know, the part of it is narrated by a dead guy. Mm-hmm. And he has a pretty broad point of view about what happened in the world. And uh, I, I think his point of view informs that idea that that we start out one place you know that we he thought he thought he was going to change the world he ends up becoming a very interesting kind of con artist uh which i don't know that that was necessarily his grand plan but that's how that's how his life evolved and i think a lot of us fell into stuff you know i mean i i ended up in show business and i always wanted to get involved in in filmmaking and i ended up in the tv side but i can't say that i charted a deep course through it but i certainly saw the the constrained world of the 90s through my experience mostly in the in the uh, early to late 80s as i worked in that universe particularly in la and i think that was that's in the book because that's what i lived through you know that was important to me yeah I, i'm glad you mentioned showbiz you're, you're, you're making it easy for me because you're, you're you're going through my questions uh because you come from that world i want to hear a little bit about that because i'm sure people are going to be fascinating you were in a uh, production executive in Hollywood for years. And as someone who comes from TV, I find this novel striking because it's so un-TV-like to me. To me, it's, it's, it's very literary in a good way. Uh, I'm, and I'm talking about the style. I'm talking about the language. Like, you seem to save... The, you, to me, read like a writer who savors the language. This is not a plot where it just kind of skitters along. Right there's a lot of wordplay and musicality to the language. Is is that something deliberate on your part? Were you like, yeah. I have to get away from this kind of TV brain and become the writer? No, actually, my love of that kind of writing well precedes my involvement in the world of TV. 
and I was always a very serious reader. And the writers that I've always responded to deeply, like Robert Stone and Thomas Pynchon and Don DeLillo, are sentence writers, Philip Roth. And I felt a lot of the writing rhythmically. And there was perfectly good senses that I didn't end on, didn't end up with, because they didn't jangle in my head. The music was at work. And that was important to me. I just heard a quote from DeLillo, which is very interesting. He said, I don't care what a sentence means, I care how it sounds. Well, I like both, I have to admit. That does, it is important to me uh, uh, what it means. But I do like the way words fit together. And you know, maybe it's, I was a, have been and always a big kind of sit around the campfire folk singer. Hmm. You know, so that kind of that kind of experience is probably ingrained in my in, in my experience. Yeah. Well, I, I you know it's it's a sort of book where I it, it, it's interesting you mentioned Pinchon because I, I I mean this reminded me a little bit of Inherent Vice. It, it sort of had the same flavor to, to me. Um, but there were, there were a lot of sentences where I just kind of wanted to call my wife in the other room and read the sentences out loud. I don't get that with a lot of contemporary fiction. And, and that's a pleasure. It's, uh, you know, there's not, maybe not enough of that. Uh, you mentioned the music. I know you're a music fan. You're a jazz fan. But obviously, reading the book, it's, it's, it goes all over the place, right? And if you, if you go to my website, uh, www.richardmraven.com, there's a Spotify playlist that I put together of important music from the 70s. Okay. Uh, there's also a list of, I, I put together about five or six recipes for various dishes that are mentioned in the book. Well, the, the, you're, once again, you're, 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 you're hitting my question before I get it, because I want to talk about the relationship between these things. Um, the, it, and, and I didn't look at the Spotify list, but, but let me guess who's on it. There, there has to be uh, The Who. Is The Who on it? Absolutely. Who, the Who plays an important role in the book. And maybe uh, like Eric Dolphy. Yeah, not Dolphy, but uh, uh, I think Mingus is on, is on the playlist. Okay. And, and what um, else? Say it again? What else is on the playlist? Well, you know, it won't play this way in Spotify when you play it, but the first song that I put on was White Punks on Dope by the Tubes. <laughs> yeah. Because that's what my housemates and I would blast as we were cleaning house. Yeah. Uh, 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 and and it typified the era for me. Not that I was a white punk on dope. I wasn't. In fact, I, I didn't uh, smoke that much dope after college. <laughs> yeah. at all. But uh, <clears throat> but there, there was an energy. But there's Latin music because there's, there's a lot of merengue music in my novel. Mm. And there's Latin music on the playlist and and jazz. I mean, I mentioned Miles Davis, and I was just I was just and he he comes up in the book and. A friend of mine was just posting on Facebook, and I happened to mention a Miles Davis concert I saw in Newport in 1969 that blew me away. So, yeah, all kinds of music, and I've always been a kind of polyman, so polyplot, around music, all kinds. Yeah, and you, you write about music in a way, and, and I wonder how much you, you thought of this, in a way that just assumes a sort of music literate reader. In other words, you, you, don't, you allude to a lot of music, and you just assume that the reader's going to be able to kind of at least follow you or be willing to maybe put the phone down and put the book down and, and, and look things up. Was that a conscious decision? Did you say, you know what, I'm just going to assume my readers are, are thoughtful and sort of culturally literate about these things? They've been more unconscious than conscious, but I do think when, when I was in Hollywood, <clears throat> my work was developing screenplays with writers for Movies of the Week and miniseries primarily. And you could always tell when a horrible bit of exposition would thump onto the page. And we used to joke about it and call it, my uncle, comma, the richest man in Paris, comma, is coming to dinner tonight. And so I swore to myself that if I ever started writing myself, I would do everything I could to eliminate that kind of work. It's just not interesting writing to me. And so, so I think I just decided you can't explain everything. And... The world is the world, and you have to go and ride in that world. And I hope it comes alive for people and makes them curious about the stuff they don't know about. Yeah. That's why I put some of that stuff on my website so that people could clock in and see what I was talking about. Hmm. Yeah, it, at the edges of the novel is a lot of evoc evocative music writing. Um, and there's a lot of, of food writing. I mean, this could be this is the sort of book where I can imagine that when they put together those like anthology of like food writing sort of bit, that you could pull parts of this book out and, and fit them in there. And I'm wondering about the relationship between these three things, between the 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 mind that's drawn to writing, 
the mind drawn to food and the dry, uh, the mind drawn to music. What's the what's the relationship here? Gosh, I have no idea. <laughs> um, I mean, they're all. I mean, I, they're all things that that are you know, deep within me. I've been an amateur, happy cook for many many years. I started cooking when I was in college as a way I hoped to interest women in hanging out with me, and I got perhaps more meals than partnership out of the deal, but I did learn to cook and uh, enlightened self-interest, I guess. And I've just kept up with it. And now more than ever, I've become one of those you know, cliched COVID bread bakers, you know, that are making sourdough. Sure. So uh, why the switch to, to being a novelist at this point? You were, you know, you worked in TV and you worked, you did all these things. And now it's like, now this is, this is what you're going to do. What happened? What's the process? Well, part of the process, you know, I spent a lot of time making blueprints for other things, right? You write a screenplay, you develop a screenplay, you market a screenplay, it's, it's on its way to becoming something else. And if you're lucky, the thing you end up with is some relative of the thing you start out with. And I always decided that when I started writing, I didn't write screenplays, but I would write the thing that would be finished in and of itself. It would be the thing itself when it was done. And that's what I wanted to do, and that's what I, I think I've done. Yeah. You know, it's a whole piece. You don't, you know, you don't, you don't need to uh, go to a movie theater or turn on your TV to, to, to see what somebody did to it. Um, and I think so that was, the, that was why. And I think, as I said, I've been, you know, I've been a devoted reader. You know, when I, I was the boy who, who at the age of 10 or 11 went to his local library and, and took out three books a week. And the local librarian, wonderful librarian named Miss Line, remember her well, would know what kind of books I liked and she would have some ready for me. And we had this ongoing weekly relationship. And so it started, you know, when I was a kid as a reader. And I think that, you know, in order to be a good writer, you have to be a good reader and pay attention to what's happening in the reading you're doing so that you can um, model yourself. In the end, it's all filtered through your own consciousness, so you know, I think it, it, becomes, it, it becomes your own thing. Tell me about your, your writing process. Are there particular times of the day? Do you listen to music while you, you write? Do you set yourself goals? Is it, is it more intuitive? What's your writing process? Well, you know, it's interesting. If the, uh, when I was working on the first draft of this, uh, for a while I listened to nothing but Grateful Dead while I was writing. And, and, but then when I got into doing a very serious second draft, that didn't work, and I felt that what I wanted, what I wanted that draft to achieve, was more emotional uh, content for the characters. And so I, I, I listened to Molly <laughs> almost exclusively because there's a lot of high, heightened and grand musical emotion in his symphony. And and uh, and then when I was doing a lot of other, like this book has been revised a gazillion times. Um, I could only listen to instrumental music. I could no longer listen to music with words that would get in the way of my of my process and then it ended up being a lot of jazz because i just love jazz yeah you know it's it's interesting i wrote about this recently in the, the magazine in my letter from the editor i i found i, I mean my musical t i listen to a lot of different types of music and they tend to to shift based on where i'm at uh you know wherever i'm at in my professional life and the weather and all these things kind of especially if you love music right the seasons make a difference yeah. Uh, and I, I wondered, I felt like I was undergoing some pretty big shifts during COVID because of this kind of isolation. So I found myself lot, listening to a lot of early music and Baroque music. And I just, I just started to wonder why. Did you feel as though during COVID, during this period, you also had a, a shift in your tastes? In a way, in a way. But it was more in my sort of video taste than in my musical taste. Okay. Because I found, you know, I'm... I'm a bit older than you, and so I'm in a higher risk category. And I found that my anxiety level was higher than I liked it to be. Hmm. So I found that it, in, of an evening, I couldn't watch very darkly challenging stuff. It, just, it would just make me want to crawl into a different hole than the one I already was in. So I'm not saying it's purely benign, but it, it needed to be well contained, let's, let's say. It couldn't be too raw because I just couldn't, I couldn't handle it. Yeah, so what were you watching? What, 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 what drew you in? I'm a, you'll laugh at me. The Great British Baking Show. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I will laugh, but I will also be sympathetic. And my wife, if she's listening, is laughing now, too. I think I've been through it twice now because I find that, you know, and it's not just because I'm interested in baking. I mean, I don't do that much baking. I do some. And I'm not bad at it, but not like these people. 
but it's it's the 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 camaraderie of those of those competitors that it's so you're so interested so apparently interested in each other and, and caring of each other and I think that sense is something we all need and in fact that links back to the book because you know I grew up at a time when we thought we were all in this together and we were all going to pull through together and things are much more fractured fractured now unhappily I think and you know I'm yearning to go back to that sense of communal intention. Yeah, I you know I'm I'm wondering about that that shift in in how it relates to the experience of of reading or maybe looking back on this novel. I mean, this happens with anything. Like if you're watching a, you know, any movie, any TV show, or reading a book, it's always like oh, like now I'm seeing it through the prism of COVID. This would be a different novel if we hadn't been through COVID, right? Because that that idea of there being this sort of Santa Cruz where you could you know there was this tremendous freedom and all these this stirring of, of cultural energies like that's like oh that that's science fiction right now <laughs> yeah absolutely right and it adds a, a, a maybe a layer of sorrow onto it as well it may it may you know um <clears throat> the famous greek guy once said you can't step into the same river twice life is always changing you know and um you, you, you can't predict i mean every it's it's fascinating to me there are People I know who read the book, some really glom on to this middle section in Santa Cruz. Some really like the New England stuff because that's where they're from and they relate to it. Others really like the last part of the book uh, because of the sort of emotional quality of it. And I think everybody gets to read their own book and write almost write in their head their own book when they're reading. And and um, you know, if I had to say anything else about this, I'd say you know, probably my biggest motivation in in, in doing the story is that I love storytelling. I mean, even though a lot of the works that I, the, the, uh, the work that I did in Hollywood was for pretty, you know, mediocre stuff. You know, used to say it's good for what it is. And it was rare that we got to say it was just plain good, you know. And um, that, God, I think I lost my train of thought. doesn't matter. <laughs> I, you know, so it's storytelling. And, it, you know, I, I, I think I've always, I mean, I used to, my dad taught me how to tell jokes, you know. I mean, I just think this is sort of part of part of my nature, and I like the shapeliness of it. So maybe it's the shapeliness of a recipe with all the orderly qualities of a recipe, and I do find that incredibly common to be, you know, as opposed to the kind of cooks who are brilliant who say, okay, I went to the store today, and they had these, you know, these white eggplants, so I'm going to do this with the eggplants and add that. I'm a guy who likes to see, oh, I need 13 ingredients. Let me get them all out on the counter in front of me and weigh them out if I have to, you know, and that's, you know, that, and I think there's an orderly quality to the way I structured the book. I mean, it was important to me. And yeah. that, and I think that structural stuff probably keys back into what we, you know, movies are all about structure. You know, you, know, you have to hit your marks, you have to, you know, deliver certain moments to the audience in certain places. It may seem completely organic and seamless, but there's a lot of careful thought that goes into when things happen and how. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny when you mention, uh, you know, people's different experiences reading the novel. Because to me, uh, the the New England stuff or the stuff set in Somerville was like grim reality. And and I'm reading it, and it's it's cold right at the beginning of the novel. You're in Somerville, and it was cold when I was reading the book. And then everybody gets to go off to to you know California, and there's pretty girls all of a sudden, and there's music, and everybody's having a good time. And then when it gets back to Massachusetts, it's grim again. So I, I see that as, as, you know, grim reality versus some sort of escape. Now, the escape is, is no uh, fantasy land. It's no utopia. There's some really, really difficult things. And, and I think, as you, as you said before, there's a lot of cultural stuff percolating that's just clearly going nowhere, right? That's just, that's just um, uh, you know, f flat or endless or, or, you know, people are, are being narcissistic when they think they're out there trying to, you know, make the world a better place. And, and pe they're d people who are damaged psychologically in the novel, characters who are kind of damaged. But still, I still wanted to go to Santa Cruz. I was still like, man, I'd like to be out there on the moped riding. And, and man, what it seems like a great time. Well, the, <clears throat> the earliest versions of this book, those frigid scenes, I wrote in California <laughs> in, in broad sunlight. But, you know, the writers in that, you, you have to have a good imagination and a good memory, I think, to do the kind of writing that I like. And you know, one of the things about this book, 
and that was important to me. I wanted a story that moved physically from place to place to place, and I wanted a story that moved internally from state to state to state. And so the main character in particular goes through um, a voyage, external and internal. And you know, I wanted to link those and let them each have their own their own sort of vib vibrational quality. And for those who like a travelogue, you know, the story ends up in, you know, part of the story ends up in Bali hmm. and, and in rural Hawaii. You know, it's nice to go far flung. I like books that take me places I haven't been before. Absolutely. I, I was there. It was nice. It was nice to read, uh, you know, on a day when I, I was up shoveling for three hours in my driveway because I did get to go to Bali and Hawaii yeah. and, and smell the smells and, and uh, you know, see the fruit in my head. And, and uh, it, was, it was pleasant. I'm not sure that Bali is there anymore, but of course that Bali probably wasn't there when I was there too. People were saying, oh, you should have been here. Every place you go that's wonderful, they say you should have been there 20 years ago. Yeah. Before it got discovered. <clears throat> so, but I did, I, my wife and I, when our daughter was 13, took her out of school for four months, <coughs> excuse me, and did a Southeast Asia trip. We started in Australia because my wife had a connection there. And then we did uh, Indonesia, both Bali and Java, and Thailand, Singapore, uh, what was called then Burma, and uh, Nepal. And um, it was a very important event in all of our lives as, as a family. And But you know, I got to use all that stuff when I was writing the book. Yeah, absolutely. I can see that. So uh, I want to see if Lou has any questions, but before we open it up to Lou, uh, what's next? What are you working on now? I'm working on a, <clears throat> a an L.A. set detective story in which the main character is uh, a thing called a uh, certified ethical hacker. Because there are people who are, have, you know, who, who are hired to hack computer systems to test their, <clears throat> their defenses. And I'm curious to see what happens if a guy who's been certified ethical is pushed to become unethical. But I can't tell you why or how. I just know that that, to me, was a job for our age. Yeah, yeah you know, I saw that you were going to do detective fiction next, and you're going from something that's more literary to, to detective fiction. But now I see the link. It's, it's not going to be standard genre fiction, it sounds like. Well... It'll have, I guess it'll have some of the standard movements of genre fiction, but no, it's, it's an, it'll be an investigation of a time and a place <clears throat> and a character. I mean, that's, I think detective novels can carry that trait really well, though. I read a lot of crime fiction, hmm. and the best ones are like our travelogues and internal, internal uh, voyages. You know, the best line I read ever about a, uh, how to write a detective story was something the great crime writer Michael Connolly was once told <clears throat> by a cop. Connolly used to be a journalist in, LA, in, in on the LA Times covering crime beat. That's how he started writing the Harry Bosch novels. <clears throat> and a cop once said, the cop doesn't work the case. The case works the cop. So that's what I'm looking to do. Very cool. Lou, do you have a question for our guest? Yeah, I've got several questions. I'm I'm interested. I'm always interested when I talk to an author about that seminal moment when they decide I'm going to write a book. And for me, I'm I'm a writer in that I cash checks for it, and I've been doing it for a long time. And I've got a few chapters of a novel put together, but never reach that seminal moment. Whereas my son wrote one at 19 and and put it out. So it's it's just fascinating to me that moment when you get that motivation to say I'm going to write a novel, and you actually sit down and do it. What was that like for you? Well, it was great. I mean, I had I had worked for <clears throat> more than a decade in this very crushing kind of career, you know, seven days a week if I let it. And uh, when I left, I finally said, I can't, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, <clears throat> and I'd saved a bunch of money because I was overpaid and overworked. <laughs> and <clears throat> so we could coast for a while. And, and I said, okay, I'm going to write this book. And that began a long time ago. And Many early drafts then went away. Excuse me, I've got it. <laughs> Something went down the wrong way. Hold on. Happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. And so, so I, um, I just let it all go. And I, and I said when I quit 
my, my business career, <clears throat> I felt more like myself five minutes later than I had in years. I, uh, but, but it was a lot harder. I think I'm the worst boss I ever had, <laughs> as far as that's concerned. It is hard, and I think one of the blocks for me is that whole drafting process, because I have never been a person who enjoys rewriting anything. It's like, I've written it, it's out there, you know, we can tweak it, we can proof it, we can, you know, spruce it up, but I'm not going to sit down and rewrite the thing. So that's been always been a, a fallback for me. Plus, I don't like reading what I write. So that going back and proofing it and reevaluating it is always a problem as well. We're told that the first novel is largely autobiographical, if only wishfully autobiographical. Are you in this novel, or, or is this anything like the life you had or the life you, that you wanted to have? You know, I'm going I'm to say something in French. You know, uh, <clears throat> Flaubert famously said, uh, Madame Bovary, c'est moi, you know, and, and which means I am Madame Bovary. He's a man. And I'm everybody in this book because it's all, you know, sort of fraction, you know, fractions of various in interests, knowledge, <clears throat> and experience, and imagination. I was very interested in writing fiction. I took certain building blocks of things that had happened to me or that I've observed, but this story is completely fictionalized. That said, I did go through a rather cataclysmic death in my life. <clears throat> when he was 33, my brother died in an accident, mountain climbing accident. And I learned then what it meant to have to take that experience in and process it. And so I was interested in seeing what I could do with that, <clears throat> what I, how I could turn my own experience into something useful on the page for me as a writer. All we have is our own context, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. <clears throat> finally, you talk about storytelling, and storytelling is an art form that goes back for ages, but storytelling in a novel has its unique challenges because a novel is meant to be a long-term experience for a reader. I mean, I know some people go through them in a day or a couple of days or things like that, but it's supposed to be a rather lengthy experience as opposed to sitting by the campfire and telling a story. So that yin and yang of giving a little bit to keep people drawn along down the path and not giving everything... And I'm guessing, because the book that I've started, the chapters I have, were exactly the way you described it. I have no idea what's going to happen in the book. I have no idea. I just started writing it. And in fact, I started it in the middle and, and just kind of working around it. And I'm kind of investigating the way it's going to be, too. So I'm guessing uh, in novel storytelling, that's one of the challenges, right? Being able to give enough to keep people walking down the path, but not, not give everything out till the end. Yes, and it was a struggle for me, you know, the, <clears throat> because as I was writing the, my initial intention, my initial structure of this book was alternating chapters, present and past, present and past. And I find I couldn't write it that way because <clears throat> the character in the present knew what was happening in the past before I even knew what it was. <laughs> Finally, I just created this big lump and wrote my way through it. Hmm. So... so <clears throat> You wanted to read something. You want to take a sip? It sounds like your throat's a little dry. You want to take yeah, a sip of water, so. <laughs> and then we'll, uh, and, and, you know, take a breath. No, 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 no rush. Here's the cover of the book. Yeah, the novel's called Nothing to Declare. Author is Richard Raven, who lives in, in Newbury. And when you're ready, feel free to, uh, to go ahead and, and uh, take it away. This is chapter one, page one. <clears throat> 1990. It promised to get there before dark. Mrs. Folari wasn't comfortable opening her door to strangers. <clears throat> Not in February. The month was devoted to bad luck. But Jesse was lost and he was losing the light. His knuckles gripped the wheel more tightly with every passing block. At the smallest tap of his foot, the rented Lincoln surged forward. The thing knew where it wanted to go, even if he hadn't a clue. He watched for street signs out of the corner of his eye. He could be anywhere, Everett, maybe, or Medford, someplace on the edge of what he remembered. Maybe he'd crossed in and out of Somerville already, its expressways and rotaries named after the Korean War dead, the tiny red, white, and blue memorial flag. He couldn't tell. L.A. and its grid, its east and west, had bled every curve from memory. At a blinking red light, he paused and scratched at the ice on inside of a side, win uh, side window. Empty, windblown sidewalks and a magazine stand shilling the lottery. A muffler shop in the corner, a street sign so covered with snow he could read only the last three letters, L-E-Y Street. 
75 degrees when it left Santa Monica this morning and the acacias in full blossom. The lanes of the Palisade had been, car had been carpeted in yellow. The street lights popped on and lit a row of dun-colored houses with stained cars in their drives. In the middle of the block, a man dragged his garbage can to the street and propped it against a heap of snow and gravel. Before he reached the door, <clears throat> a gust blew the can over and spilled chicken bones and Sunday supplements. The man pivoted, the wind ballooning his overcoat, his mittened hands balled into fists. Another pivot and he stomped inside his house. The Christmas lights on his door flashed on. Somerville. Jesse was sure of it. Marty had come back here to live, had been here for the last 14 years, if that could be believed. Marty had hated the place. Hell, they'd hated it together. Jesse steered the Lincoln carefully around the corner, a boat this big, no point chancing a ding. Ellie Wyman duly he hoped, the street where Marty lived, had lived. Great. Thank you so much. I, where's the uh, where's the best place for people to pick up pick up a copy? Well, it's available on at all online sources in the in the area. It's available at Jabberwocky right now, and there are signed copies there. If if people go to my website, <clears throat> there are links you can click right there on the website that will take you to Barnes and Noble and Amazon and other online sources. Yeah, to, you mentioned that you were dropping off copies at Jabberwocky um, before the show, and I just like to kind of make the point to people that we want to support local businesses as much as possible. So if you get the chance and you're out in that area, uh, Jabberwocky is an amazing independent bookstore. Uh, and I hope, uh, I hope people who are curious will stop by and pick up a copy of the book there. Uh, Richard Raven, thank you so much for being on the 495. Well, it's been I, great to be here. Thank you both for your great questions. Yeah, really, really appreciate it. I loved it. <clears throat> Nothing to declare is his novel, Richard Raven. Thank you very much, everybody. I'll thank see you. you next week. All right. Take care. Oh,